So design thinking in relation to taking making in the classroom is an, a process piece, and it's a process piece that engages the participants in divergent thinking. It engages them in a human-centered, um, empathetic design process. And I keep stressing the word process because it's not this and that or bits and pieces. It's an actual process by which the users unpack the design challenge and use design thinking to problem find rather than problem solve. And it's my pleasure now to introduce Shane Austin, who is a designer. He works in downtown Kelowna with CoLab. He is, was instrumental in our first Maker Day of helping us understand why design thinking and empathetic design and human-centered design has to be at the heart of all making in the future. Otherwise, it's just you might as well go to Michael's or you might as well go to the birdhouse workshop at Home Depot and have at it. So Shane gives us that rich underpinning and it's just my pleasure if you would join me in welcoming Shane to talk to us about 14-15 minutes about the power and the impact of design thinking. I just want to say a sincere thank you for allowing me in your world today. Uh, it's my very uh, great pleasure to be able to work with you. Uh, as Susan mentioned, I worked in downtown Kelowna and I've been a designer uh, working in technology for about 14 or 15 years. So uh, hopefully I'm not talking over your heads and getting too uh, cryptic sounding a lot of my tech speak. But I tried to work on a talk today that really spoke to design thinking and its value, uh, both to myself as a designer and in the world. So it's a bit of a whale of a topic, okay? So instead of uh, charting out a garrulous agenda throughout the day, I'm gonna tell you some stories and share some insights and pose a powerful question to you. How can you change the world with design? And I'll start with a personal story. About two years ago, I was hired to lead a communications and public outreach project with the government of Alberta uh, in the office of the public guardian. And this project was extremely promising as it embraced all the values that I sought out in a challenging design. And the aim of this campaign was to communicate vital information about life planning and decision making to individuals, families, and communities. It had multiple dimensions, uh, a vast audience, all with different capabilities and knowledge, polarizing with a government organization with strict mandates and slow moving processes. So we went through months of research idea exploration and conceptualization and the work became rather grueling and we weren't really making the speedy progress that we assumed that we would make. Then everything changed. My grandfather was becoming ill and I was deeply immersed in family worries and emotional struggle. In calls to my grandfather I was getting first-hand experience with the difficult and challenging world of a man who couldn't handle change or the unfamiliar world that was being forced on him. He no longer had the capabilities to communicate, and despite having a caring and compassionate family, we had a hard time balancing empathetic care with realistic decision-making about the future. So after this artist's personal journey, my entire outlook on the Office of the Public Guardian project changed. We now thoughtfully interviewed real people. We shifted from text-heavy content to beautifully crafted videos. And the entire design of the site was centered around the needs and challenges of the audience. So skip forward, within months, we are celebrating the completion of our work and we're confident of its value and success. Our team was rocking high fives and the client was ecstatically happy. And then the province had a new election and new premier, then everything changed. But that's another story. So before I talk about design thinking, I think it's important to talk about the definition of design. And in fact, that many are unclear about the meaning of design, mistaking it for art and aesthetics. The definition of design comes from the Latin word, which is designare. And designare means to designate, so giving meaning to things. It's not about style, it's not about technology, it's not about the functionality. What is the meaning that people give to this product? And design is about the evolution of this meaning. Design is the order and the sense that we impart on an otherwise chaotic existence. Design is the structure that we humans impose over what is. 
It's the meaning we give to experience that in and of itself might not have any meaning. Design is structure and purpose where maybe none exists naturally. Design has an important connection to the innovation of products, services, and business models. And the way design can innovate things is by changing the meaning or making things more meaningful. So here's the problem and where design thinking comes in. It goes without saying that the world is incredibly complex and is constantly growing in complexity. Previously stable systems are beginning to strain and we're frantically looking for new approaches to develop, manage, and innovate. Design thinking allows us to step back from the immediate issue and take a broader look. It requires systems thinking, seeing problems as a part of a larger ecosystem, and that finding solutions requires a holistic view centered on human needs. When design thinking is performed faithfully, it's beneficial in large problem spaces where innovation is sorely needed, such as healthcare, government, and education. There are many ways of teaching and practicing design thinking, and definitions vary accordingly. So I'll pose a few of the more popular descriptions for you. So first, design thinking is a design methodology. It differs from traditional design approaches in a number of specific ways, for example, some characterize design thinking as a more creative and user-centered approach than traditional design approaches. It's a problem-solving approach or process. So design thinking can be regarded as a problem-solving method or, by some definitions, a process for the resolution of challenges. As a solution-based approach for solving problems, design thinking is particularly useful for addressing so-called wicked problems. It's a creativity approach. Unlike analytical thinking, which is associated with the breaking down of ideas, design thinking is a creative process based on building up ideas. Analytical approaches focus on narrowing down design choices, while design thinking focuses on going broad, at least during the early stages of the process. In design thinking, designers do not make any early judgments about the quality of their ideas. So as a result, this minimizes the fear of failure and maximizes input and collaboration. Outside the box thinking is encouraged in the earlier process stages, since it's a style of thinking that's believed to lead to creative solutions that would not have emerged otherwise. So the motto here is everyone is a designer. Okay, last, it's a human-centered approach that brings design into the real world. Design thinking is more creative and human-centered in an approach to problem solving than traditional design methods. They point out that design thinking defies the obvious and instead embraces a more experimental approach. The heart of the method is understanding the user. All ideas and subsequent work stem from knowing the user. Okay, so I wanna talk a little bit about the process. Okay, design thinking is broken up to what are called five uh, process stages or modes. They're all iterative. We have empathy. The objective empathy is to help designers articulate the latent needs of users throughout research and deep understanding. Three ways that designers learn to have empathy for their users are through immersion, observation, and engagement. The second stage is define. The ultimate goal of the define stage is to develop a deep understanding of your users and the design space. You want to create an actionable point of view which works as the foundation for brainstorming. Next we have ideate. So ideating is a critical component of design thinking and the process of idea generation. Designers are challenged to brainstorm a myriad of ideas and to suspend judgment. No idea is too far-fetched and no one's ideas are rejected. Ideating is all about creativity and fun, and in this, this phase, quantity is encouraged. So designers may be asked to generate 100 ideas in a single session. They may be uh, silly, savvy, risk-taking, wishful thinking, dreaming. It, anything is possible. Next, we have prototyping. This one is really key to today. Prototyping is a rough and rapid portion of the design process. A prototype can be a sketch, a model, or a cardboard box. It's a way to convey an idea quickly and get feedback. Designers learn that it's better to fail early as they 
Often they create these prototypes to learn and validate ideas. And finally, test, implement, and improve. So testing is a part of an iterative process that provides participants with feedback. The purpose of testing is to learn what works and what doesn't and then iterate. Okay, so the test mode extends iteration in which we are uh, low resolution artifacts, or we, sorry, place our low resolution artifacts in the appropriate context of the user's life. In regards to a team's solution, we should always prototype, prototype as if we know we're right, but test as if we know we're wrong. Okay, so this is all more or less what we call the Wikipedia definition of design thinking. In fact, you could probably look it up on Wikipedia right now. It doesn't actually sit well with me, guys. Design doesn't fit snugly into tidy, well-defined boxes. And if I'm going to give you an understanding of the meaning of design thinking, we'll have to dig a little bit deeper. Okay, so people we, who we often refer to as designers apply creative thinking to solve problems, large and small. But really, who are the design thinkers? Okay, they're not these guys. These smug, Mac-using, bad sweater-wearing hipsters drinking espresso and complaining about typography. It's not that professionally trained designers aren't a part of the process, but are instead a part of a collaborative, multidisciplinary team, all holding different roles. Okay, and that's not actually me. I left my dad's sweater at home. <laughs> but this guy, Leonardo, Leonardo da Vinci, designed many great things in his time and might be considered a design thinker and most certainly an innovator. Despite his lack of formal education, from his youth, Leonardo showed a profound grasp of mathematics. He used his knowledge of optics for both art and engineering. He designed aqueducts and bridges. He even built a bathroom for the Duchess and stage managed the gatherings and lavish, lavish spectacles of the Duke. It was as if he was intoxicated with knowledge of all sorts. He investigated steam as a locomotive power and navigation, magnetic attraction, and the circulation of the blood. He even developed a prototype for a motor car. So designing is a human response to the world. We are all designers. We manipulate the environment to better serve our needs. We select which items to own, which items to have around us. We build, buy, arrange, and restructure all this to form design. When consciously, deliberately rearranging objects at our desks, the furniture in our living rooms, and the things we keep in our cars, we're designing. Through these personal acts of design, we transform the otherwise anonymous, commonplace things and spaces of everyday life into our own things and our own places. Through our designs, we transform houses into homes, spaces into places, things into belongings. While this may not have any control over the design of many objects we purchase, we do control which we select and then just how, where, and when they are to be used. I'm going to go back to storytelling. I'm going to tell you a little bit of a story about a boy and a windmill. So William Kamkwamba from Malawi was born into a family with seven children. The only boy was seven girls. He was just a simple farmer in a country of poor farmers. And like everyone else, he grew corn. In 2001, South Africa was caught in a terrible famine. Within months, Malawians were star going to starve to death. His family ate one meal per day at night. And they were just withering away due to starvation. To make matters worse, due to costs and school fees, William was forced to drop out of school. He was faced with a terrible problem, and he had to act before it was too late. He was determined to pursue his education and would make regular trips to the library to read science books. The English language was a challenge, so he used the diagrams and pictures to discover the meanings of the words around them. Day after day, he would visit the library, absorbing knowledge. In his studies, he discovered a book on windmill power. He learned that if constructed correctly, a windmill could pump water and generate electricity. Pump water meant irrigation for crops, which would act as a defense against hunger. There was a huge obstacle. He didn't have any materials to use. That didn't hold him back. He went to a scrapyard where he salvaged materials, despite his family and community members thinking he'd gone crazy. 
First, he built a prototype using a radio motor. Then his initial five meter windmill out of a broken bicycle, tractor fan blade, old shock absorber, and, and blue gum tires. After hooking the windmill to a car battery for storage, William was able to power four light bulbs and charge neighbors' mobile phones. This system was even equipped with a home homemade light switches and a circuit breaker made from nails, wire, and magnets. The windmill was later extended to 12 meters to better catch the wind above the trees. A third windmill pumped gray water for irrigation. Subsequent projects included clean water, malaria prevention, solar power, and lighting for six homes in his family compound. A deep water well with solar powered pumps for clean water, drip, a drip irrigation system, and the outfitting of the village team when they united with their first ever uniforms and shoes. So this windmill project drew many visitors from kilometers around, and news of William's inventions reached the program director for TED Global, and he was asked to become a TED fellow and speak. So while at TED, he was interviewed about his pursuit of building a windmill, and he simply stated, I tried and I made it. William Kimcombe was a design thinker. So with the right outlook, you could be a design thinker. Heck, you guys could already be design thinkers. A, as design thinking is a mindset, there are five essential traits that define a design thinker that you want to embrace. It all begins with empathy. Design thinking is human-centered and holistic and starts with a very empathetic understanding of the people you're designing for. You should imagine the world from multiple perspectives, those of colleagues, clients, end users, customers, and so on. Next, we have integrative thinking, which tells us that we should not only rely on analytical processes, but also exhibit the ability to see all of the hidden and sometimes contradictory aspects of a tough problem and create novel solutions that go beyond and dramatically improve existing alternatives. Optimism carries the belief that a different world is possible. You should assume that no matter how challenging the constraints of a given problem, at least one potential solution is better than the existing alternatives. Typically, you maintain a non-judgmental and open mindset. Significant innovations don't come from inc incremental tweaks, but from experimentalism. Design thinkers pose questions and explore constraints in creative ways that proceed in entirely new directions. I know that this is difficult in large organizations because of complex relationships, but it's important to push and create safe spaces for experimentation. This one is near and dear to my heart, guys. We work together in collaborative teams cooperatively to produce a better outcome. The increasing complexity of products, services, and experiences has replaced the myth of the lone creative genius with the reality of an enthusiastic interdisciplinary collaborator. If you still aren't sure if design thinking is for you, I'll go a step further with a story that's gonna hit close to home for you guys. Here's a short video on how design thinking empowers young people from an organization called People Serving People, a homeless shelter in Minneapolis where local design firms and educators work together to show kids how design thinking could help them make a difference in their neighborhoods. Design thinking isn't a foolproof process or a system for delivering innovative design solutions. More important than processes, you must trust in design thinking's fundamental principles and always be sensitive to people and the environment that you're designing for. An acute awareness of context is everything. If you shift your mindset from the producer or the owner of the design to that of a facilitator and a participant jointly making the solution, it opens the door for a more meaningful, profitable, and productive design. And if you trust in yourself, you will be a successful designer. Leonardo da Vinci, a designer. William Kamkwamba, a designer. And in this featured movie, this game for kids, all designers. So before I finish up, I want you to say one thing for me. Are you ready? Remember, you're being watched and filmed today. So if you don't participate, we're going to heckle you from the internet. Say, I am a designer. I am a designer. No, a little better than that, a little louder. 
Yes. Thanks, guys.